And good morning. I really appreciate everyone getting up and having breakfast and coming out so uh, seemingly early for us New Yorkers, actually. So, um, but it, I was reminded at, at uh, breakfast this morning that um, architecture, in fact, is really considered to be the most collaborative of the arts. Um, and in um, university settings, I think today that's certainly the case. And hopefully, you'll feel, by way of the remarks I'm going to make about our program that we have with the World Monuments Fund, that some of that collaboration, collaborative spirit is, is part of what we do. I'd also like to thank my colleagues from Knoll and from CI Select and everyone at World Monuments for um, coming this morning and uh, some of our clients who are here as well. So this morning, we're going to talk about um, really what we're doing with World Monuments Fund. And I'm just going to talk about a little of the um, objectives of, of my talk, which is just to give you uh, some background on World Monuments, describe the program we're all involved with, and talk about several case studies um, of preservation. And this has been a, a great journey for all of us. And I think no one in this audience knows better that the places that mankind has built really have defined our history. And uh, structures like this one in Bhutan all tell a story of our past. And they frame the accomplishments and the cultural imperatives and the artistic aspirations of our world. Um, Places like this in Kyoto are a testament to everything that we've done in terms of creativity and adapting the world's diverse and multifaceted environment and really creating environments for our own use. And what we have seen, all, all of us in this room probably, is that some places like this one in Uzbekistan are places that are so important to all of us that they take on a higher sort of spiritual meaning in terms of the landscape that we all live in. And others, like this one, take on almost a more iconic uh, statement in terms of the architectural landscape that they sit in. And all structures that we look at in our daily lives, as well as vernacular structures, religious structures, whether they're part and parcel of a community or part and parcel uh, of a city, um, really take on higher meanings for the people who interact with them. And that really brings us to the topic that you all are much more versed in than I am, which is preservation. And the preservation today, the field that you're all involved in, I know demands more than the completion of high quality projects. And it's incumbent on all of us uh, in the room and all of us who spend time in the preservation community to identify problems that there are at the heart of conservation challenges and address long-term sustainability. And one of the things that we've been so involved with with World Monument has been providing the stewardship and hopefully a little bit of the economic support at the local level for preservation. So I think everyone here is pretty familiar with World Monuments, so I'm going to you know, go through this pretty quickly. But uh, as you all know, World Monuments is dedicated to saving the world's most uh, treasured environments. And since 1965, um, has operated in more than 90 countries. And the partnerships that World Monuments has uh, throughout the globe um, include um, projects in Asia, in North America, in Europe, uh, as well as in South America. Um, many of you are probably familiar with the watch list, which has been the signature advocacy program since 1996. And the list of 100 different endangered heritage sites that are published every two years really has served as a catalyst for students, for community groups, and for professionals to become engaged in the preservation uh, movement. Um, the watch list has really been one of the things that um, we've been most involved with at Knoll in terms of bringing to the foreground modern buildings that can be included with sort of historic churches, with historic um, public buildings, and with other sites uh, globally. And modernism, as you, as you probably know by way of this conference, has been one of the sort of the niche um, areas that hasn't been um, much of a topic for World Monuments types uh, installations. Uh, World Monuments Fund, as you know, has been involved with signature um, projects like this one. When I do this talk in, in student groups, this is usually the quiz part of the program. And uh, you, can, you can all grade yourselves as to whether or not uh, you know, know the sites. Um, this one, any takers? Any takers from the audience? Ellis Island, thank you. Uh, this one from the classicists in the room. 
Pompeii, of course, Machu Picchu, and lastly, uh, the Great Wall of China. Um, but the, the real thing that we've been doing with World Monuments is trying to integrate the modernist vocabulary into several of their core programs. And those programs range from advocacy, raising awareness of, of the importance of heritage and preservation on the threats in, in this field, to education and training, training professionals in the preservation um, our arena, cultural legacy, which of course speaks to saving the cultural masterpieces and important cultural sites uh, that have uh, been subject to damage or destruction. Um, lastly, capacity building, which is really something in terms of helping uh, communities to recognize uh, the value of sites that they have in their own geographies and putting together plans for those sites to be preserved. And disaster recovery, which is something um, in the last several decades that we've been all too familiar with um, as the effects of global warming and other natural disasters have impinged on important sites. Um, WMF has several special initiatives, um, climate change, Iraq cultural heritage, um, a great program in European uh, fine interiors, uh, a program in Jewish heritage, a program in sustainable tourism, and interestingly, as of about 10 years ago, uh, modernism, which is why Knoll became involved uh, with World Monuments Fund in setting up a, a program to preserve modern sites around the world. Uh, everyone in this room, I think, is very, very familiar with the need to preserve sites like the Tuganot House in uh, the Czech Republic and sort of the trials and tribulations of working with private individuals, with governments, and with municipalities and, and, and private donors uh, to, to create an environment that is, is friendly for preservation. Um, projects like this one in the United States that you're all probably familiar with, and if you haven't visited Salk, I, I, I encourage you to do so, um, you know, because this site is really one that um, is a very important in terms of the way climate has affected the physical space uh, of, of the site and um, basically um, has been subject to great public apathy, I, I think, in, in terms of, of getting the site um, fixed. Another, another site closer to home for me, which some of you may have visited, I hope, a, as children as I did, is the New York World's Fair site, where um, there's really been a great debate as to what the merit is of saving these uh, wonderful structures designed uh, by Philip Johnson. And there really hasn't been a correct adaptive reuse that has been identified to um, preserve the structures which continue uh, to deteriorate. On the, the positive side, um, if you've ever had the opportunity to see this um, Louis Cert building in um, Barcelona, this is a great example of communities coming together to actually uh, revitalize a brutalist building on, under the World Monuments uh, umbrella and address the, the physical condition of the building, especially the fenestration of the building as it affected artwork and um, other um, sort of uh, delicate at works of art that are housed in there all by um, Miro and often, as you can see here, uh, special exhibits by others. So that brings me to modernism at risk, which is really what I'd like to spend the, the bulk of the time um, discussing with you, which is the program that we founded with World Monuments in July 2006 with the goal to preserve modern landmarks. And it's really um, in response to the growing threats to modern architecture that we launched the program with, uh, uh, with the uh, WMF. And it's a new, it's a new program, uh, still very much in, in its uh, nascency. Um, we work in three particular areas. We work in architectural advocacy, um, looking at buildings that face demolition and thinking about how they can be preserved. Uh, we work in the conservation arena, um, looking at initiatives uh, for selected conservation projects that really can impact the communities where the buildings are housed. And most interestingly, and probably closest to my heart, is the public awareness initiatives that we do with students um, and university communities to sort of promote the, the modernist um, aesthetic, not only in terms of its historical context, but also in terms of the role of modernism in the communities where uh, these buildings exist. 
Um, I encourage you all to take a look at the Modernism at Risk website um, if you have not done so. Um, and you can see some of the great projects um, that WMF is working on in general uh, as, and also some of the projects that we've worked in. Um, the one thing that I sort of want to uh, orient you to, and those of you who are educators in, in the room, is the exhibition that we have um, circulating on the program. And the exhibition, Modernism at Risk, Solutions for Saving Modern Landmarks, um, really was designed to bring a greater awareness to the entire subject of preserving modern buildings and extending the lives of these buildings. Um, the show opened originally at the Florida College of Design, um, uh, construction and planning, and as I said, is circulating uh, throughout universities uh, in the United States and actually has been uh, viewed abroad as well. And what I love about the exhibition is that it consists of 21 photographs by the noted photographer Andrew Moore. And for those of you who are interested in um, a less studied uh, view of architectural photography, I, I encourage you to explore Andrew's work on your own time. Andrew made his mark really by photographing decaying sites in Cuba um, about 20 years ago when access to many of these sites was um, much more limited than it is um, today and will be in the years ahead thanks to um, the initiatives of our, our president. And um, his, his monograph on Cuban architecture, including uh, many modernist sites, is really, is really fantastic. Um, there are case studies presented as part of the exhibition. Um, and really what we have focused on in the exhibition, and I'm going to go into some of the cases in detail in a moment, is really Main Street Modern. We've been most interested at World Monuments and Knoll in focusing on buildings that have public access. I mean, there's been a great deal of attention. Some of us were talking earlier about initiatives in Palm Springs to restore residential buildings in the modern movement. Um, but our, our initiative really has focused on buildings, and public access, um, civic buildings, educational buildings, um, even looking at um, religious buildings that have been repurposed for um, public use. So what I'd like to do, and this is probably of interest to most of you in, in the audience, is take a look at some of these um, uh, projects and uh, talk about them in terms of their historical context and some of the preservation initiatives that uh, we've, we've undertaken. Um, the first one is very uh, near and dear to anyone who's interested in the history of architecture and the history of modernism in general. It's the Gross Point Public Library, and as you can see, the architect is uh, Marcel Breuer. Anyone from Michigan here who has visited the Gross Point, uh, visited the po Gross Point Public Library? It's an amazing, uh, uh, amazing building. And uh, Breuer, as you all know, is recognized as a pivotal leader in the modern architectural movement in the 20s and 30s, of course, as um, uh, master uh, of the Baja School, and I, I included this photograph in the in this talk because I think it captures so much about what Breuer is about, um, what Breuer's journey to the United States really was so much about, and um, what he stood for not only in the context of architecture, but also, as you can see, in furniture design. This photograph is by John Narr, who is another um, pho photographer who did a lot of portraiture of artists and designers in um, the late 50s and early 60s, and believe it or not, is, is still alive. John is. Um, 95, 96 years old now, and um, still working as a photographer, and um, most recently did a talk, um, which you can see on our uh, Noel website, about his collaborations with Massimo Vignelli, the noted graphic designer who um, was so, so important in, in defining um, modernist graphic aesthetics in the United States. And I, I would encourage you to, to take a look at his talk. He's a, he's a great person, and you can see from this photo Photograph. He's a great photographer in terms of capturing the emotion that Breuer brings um, to the foreground of the photograph with his espresso cup and the layering of the um, objects from uh, in the middle ground, his, his wonderful chaise lounge, his, his classic chair, and um, the architectural elements that he's so well known for uh, in the United States. This was photographed at um, his New Canaan, um, Connecticut uh, residence. 
Um, here, here is a, a, a vintage photograph of um, Breuer's Bauhaus institution, um, which um, he was forced to, um, to leave and emigrate to the United States. Um, the really cool thing about the Grosse Point Public Library is that it was celebrated so widely um, locally um, in, in the Michigan community. It, this was Breuer's first uh, public building in the United States um, when, when he came um, to our country. And um, you can see how the library and the building and these news clips really sort of talked, put the library um, in the context of the Detroit lifestyle, which of course you can never take a photograph in Detroit without an automobile for a, for a newspaper. I'm sure that was a, a, a coveted placement for, uh, does anyone know what car that is? I've never, I've never really thought about it, but um, a coveted placement for the manufacturer to be seen in the context uh, of that uh, building as a, as a background. Um, as I said, it, Gross Point was his first public commission. Um, it was designed soon after he established his own firm, and um, it really um, defined a, a moment of, of time, I think, when, um, you know, uh, editors like Henry Luce at um, Time Magazine really tried to create an atmosphere of the American architectural scene as um, becoming a dominant force in, in world artistic affairs. And here's the facade um, captured by um, Andrew at a, you know, just about this time of year, actually. And you can see that it, it's a very, very simple, simple building from the streetscape. I mean, I think the most interesting part of the facade to many people uh, is the typography, okay, and uh, the wonderful way in which Breuer sort of made Grosse Point Public Library almost into an architectural statement on the facade uh, of the building. Um, here's another view, somewhat more animated, uh, of the facade, all, all the photographs, of course, by Andrew, um, showing the relationship of the fenestration of the building to a little sort of setback streetscape um, park um, and, it, and allowing people from the street really to sort of enter the library from the street and become involved in the day-to-day um, uh, -day affairs of the library. I'm going to read to you um, uh, just a, a brief quote from a, a 1954 public lecture um, by Hawkins Ferry. Um, Hawkins's family commissioned the library and um, really intended the library to become a community center, um, which was a very, very, I think, um, forward-thinking view of what a library should be in the context of American life in the post-war era. Um, you know, hitherto libraries probably were um, dedicated to scholars and really not as open to the community. And um, I, I read you from his opening speech. The ideas and planning of many people went into the realization of this building, but its final form as we see it today is the creation of the architect Marcel Breuer. He visualized the building not, not as merely a repository of books, but as a social, cultural, and civic crystallization point. And um, those, those goals, social, cultural, and civic crystallization points, are really uh, things that I think that we see so often today in terms of the way people are thinking about new buildings, whether they're healthcare, commercial, um, educational, or, or governmental. So I, I particularly like what he had to had, had to say. Um, unfortunately, over the five decades, um, the library really was never loved by the community. And um, uh, on this view uh, of the facade, you can probably see why. I mean, it doesn't really have the sort of welcoming um, view that it did on, on, the, on the street side. Um, that said, there were very few um, minor alterations made uh, to the buildings and very few upgrades. And over time, the building did deteriorate in, in many ways. And um, it was encroached on by a parking lot, as, as only Detroit could do. Um, and it, it really became sort of a bit of an island within this um, streetscape area in, in Detroit. Um, the great thing about the library has, is the interior. And as you can see, um, the construction of the building really celebrated the light from, uh, from the street. Um, 
the Kandinsky tapestry that you see in the background um, is still there today. Um, little was moved in terms of the art program. You'll see a couple of other uh, pieces of art in, in a moment. And it's, it's really been um, a testament to just a few people to try to preserve the library and preserve Breuer's legacy um, uh, as it existed early on. Um, here you can actually see the streetscape um, uh, with the Calder uh, mobile in, in the foreground, which is, is very dramatic. The furniture is not uh, original to, to the building. Interestingly enough, the furniture uh, was originally done uh, by our firm, but it, it was, it was uh, dispersed uh, many decades ago. But you can see that the building sort of has this uncomfortable relationship with these colonial revival buildings on the other side uh, of the streets. So, you know, it, there's really, it, while there's a nod to the street, um, I think that the residents of this community at the time were probably much more comfortable with the colonial revival architecture uh, on the other side uh, of the street. Um, these are a few of the schemes that um, several of the um, architects um, who compete, who provided input to the library um, developed in order to add on to the structure and preserve the structure in its, its current form. Um, the um, community really wanted to tear down the building, okay? So everything that we did with World Monuments in terms of building community support was geared towards saving the building, providing alternatives to um, the building, and creating some additions to the building that, that you can see here, um, which have yet um, to be realized. But net, net, this is a very, very successful case study um, in terms of the ability of several different types of community groups, a national or a worldwide organization like World Monuments, and um, private individuals uh, to, to preserve the legacy uh, of the Breuer Building, which really, as I said, is important in the um, pantheon of American architecture being uh, Breuer's first building in the United States. Riverview High School is uh, probably very familiar to many of you, and it's not as happy a story. Um, as you can see on the slide, the school was demolished in 2009. It is a signature building of um, Paul Rudolph, who is uh, best known, as you know, for um, this whole sort of Sarasota modern uh, school of architecture. Um, and interestingly, um, Rudolph pioneered so many of the not only architectural idioms, but the structural idioms that we're so familiar with uh, today in, in that part of the country. Um, you can see here from, from the facade how Rudolph really was most sensitive um, to the relationship of the building, to the landscape court, and um, how he used in so many ways um, passive means for cooling and lighting the building. Um, which in this photograph um, are very well is illustrated despite the decay that you see in terms of um, the canvas screens and, and, and some of the steel beamwork as well. Um, but that really was the signature element of this building in terms of its contribution to um, the history of, of design. And unfortunately, the community um, really did not um, sort of agree with those who wanted to preserve the building. The community was dead set on building a new high school, okay, and demolishing the building to what is today uh, create a football field. So the whole tension in the community as to what the right purposes of uh, academic slash sports setting was, was hotly debated and the um, little um, discussion was really given to the um, innovations like the concrete sunshades that I showed um, it, whoops, it showed in the prior slide to the transom windows, to the open roof monitors, to um, really the whole idea of passively cooling an interior um, features that today I think those of us in the room probably value as part of the sustainability movement, but in the context of uh, educating um, high school students in um, today's world were not really seen to be uh, as relevant. And uh, here you can see the um, school as it's being built um, from the site. And um, here are just a couple of the interiors um, which the certain members of the community sought to preserve as part of a, a two-year campaign 
uh, to uh, uh, create either an alternate use for the building or to actually repurpose the building uh, for contemporary education. Um, and I, I, what I love about Andrew's photographs, once again, is sort of how they sort of capture in a very um, close and upfront way um, the spirit of the space and, and the actual function of the space. And uh, this is actually um, a part of the building which was preserved, okay? Uh, it's not really the signature uh, area of the building. It's now being used as a, uh, a community arts center. Um, but what's great about this is, you know, you get a sense of Rudolph's design, you get a sense of his, his use of, of the stairwells as, um, you know, architectural elements uh, on the exterior, and you can see um, in, in the background, too, some of the breezeway elements are, are still preserved as well. But it's not really the, the, the signature uh, uh, piece of the building. Um, interestingly, for those of you who are following modern um, uh, preservation in the Northeast. Um, there's a Rudolph building which is hotly debated right now in Orange County, which is about two hours north of New York City that uh, Frank is, is smiling because he's been involved in, in efforts to, to preserve that building. And uh, I guess we're all sort of waiting the outcome to see what happens there. That building is probably more akin to Rudolph's work at Yale in the, uh, at the architecture school in terms of its brutalist style. And um, the, the community has uh, had various um, debates as to what the fate of, the, of this municipal building should be. So I would encourage you all to take a, take a look at what's going there. Um, a couple of more photographs uh, of the interiors as they looked <laughs> during the debate, which you can imagine if you were a parent of an adolescent, which side of the uh, argument you probably would have fallen on. Um, this is another great story in terms of the work we've been doing with World Monuments. The Kent Memorial Library is in um, Suffield, uh, Connecticut, and as you can see from the slide, it was designed uh, by Warren Plattner. Um, this is the only um, building that Warren Plattner completed on a freestanding basis, and of course, those of you in the room who are familiar with Noel know that Warren Plattner also designed uh, an iconic furniture uh, suite uh, for us, which has recently had a considerable revival in terms of its popularity. But this building was completed in 1972, and um, it complements and contrasts very much the neighboring buildings on a very sort of picturesque uh, New England uh, town green. And you can see here how the building sits back from the road. It's actually opposite the historic library that the community built in the 19th century, um, which was traded to a uh, private school called Suffield Academy um, and made part of, of the Suffield campus. Um, and though it's sort of unabashedly modern, um, the scale, the hip roofs, um, echo many of the colonial uh, era uh, idioms of that place and, and recall pretty much what it's meant to be in the context uh, of a New England uh, village. The reason I love this um, little mini case study on uh, preservation of modern is that, is that I received a telephone call from an accountant in town who clearly was looking at the town budget. The town was interested in um, demolishing this building, putting up a new library, pretty much the same scenario as, as, as Gross Point. And he said he found um, the name of our program online and that he and his kids wanted to save this building. And I was like, okay, well, that sounds like a great idea. And they, they literally put together a grassroots bumper sticker campaign, you know, selling lemonade, everything you'd expect in a, you know, in a small New England town right out of the Norman Rockwell playbook and actually succeeded in, in um, convincing the town council to, um, uh, to save the building. And um, I'm going to just read you a quote from the architect Richard Munday, who is a principal of Newman Architects in New Haven. And he's a real admirer of, uh, of the building and of Plattner's work in general. Um, Very few libraries treat the book or the reader with such honor and care, and with as much attention to, act, to the act of reading. Each of its public spaces was conceived as a room, like the library in a house, 
as a warm and intimate space that welcomes the individual. And if you contrast that to most of the work that Plattner did, those of you who are familiar with the Ford Foundation or um, even his restaurant at Windows on the World, he really was taking a different tact and exploring a very different side of his, his view uh, of design. And, um, you know, he was mainly, as I said, an interior designer, working in New York City, um, did a few projects uh, in, in New Haven as well. Um, but uh, it's a very different approach, as I said, than the Ford Foundation offices, which uh, he designed, or, or many of, of the other uh, public spaces. And here you can see his um, iconic suite of furniture uh, for Knoll. Um, it's a, uh, a very um, complete uh, set of tables and, and chairs done in uh, the wire um, uh, idiom, um, sort of a uh, next step, if, if you will, to some of the work that uh, we did with uh, Harry Bertoia uh, and, a, and a, an interpretation uh, of that. I mean, these contemplative moments to me are so reminiscent of um, sort of Kyoto temples or there's sort of a, to me, there's always been very much a, a Japanese quality to the spaces um, that, that Plattner created with these garden courts. And here you can see how Andrew um, chose to sort of memorialize in a way a moment in time in library life when archives were created in boxes and people typed folder tabs with selectric blue IBM typewriters. So, uh, so, uh, and, and I should say that, uh, and you know, although this, is more, this talk is really about the buildings, you know, Andrew, this room was exact, he did not prop this room, you know, or he did not prop any of the, the interiors that I showed you. He just shot them the way, the way they were. I mean, the, the building has remarkable charisma, you know, when, on, on a sunny day. So I'm very pleased uh, that the, the Begley family uh, initiated this with us and World, World Monuments. I noted that um, we focus on uh, public spaces principally, but I thought that it would be interesting to this group to learn a little about what we did with the Goodyear House. Um, and this initiative really predates um, most of our, our work with World Monuments, and Frank can correct me on any of my uh, historical uh, blunders in terms of, of, of this particular project. But the, the Goodyear House was built by Conger Goodyear. He was the first um, curator of architecture and design at the Museum of Modern Art in New York. And as you can see here, it was really built in the style of a sprawling country house. Um, of course, the the um, uh, the parallels to Tugendhat are, are very are very very obvious in terms of what Stone uh, was thinking about. But um, the house was meant to really sit in the countryside and to um, be seen from this dramatic, um, you know, public drive um, set uh, set on a knoll. Over time, those of you who are familiar with this part of uh, Long Island know that it's been densified. It's been really subject to a, a great deal of suburban development. And when the house came on the market, um, uh, it, it really was it was debated as to how to best handle the property and deal with the property, which had been actually been given to a local community college, which wanted to monetize actually the property in terms of um, its educational uh, purposes. Um, I, this photograph, which I, I put in recently uh, to this slide deck, um, shows this wonderful Noguchi table in the foreground, um, which actually, I believe, will resurfaced at an auction um, in the last, uh, is, uh, you're, you're Frank shaking his head, but I, 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 it resurfaced in an auction um, a, a couple of months ago in a, in, a, in a modern auction. And you can see how Noguchi's work, you know, so, uh, is so sort of well suited to the, to the interior of this house and sort of creates this um, great dramatic effect of sculpture from the indoor and, and sculpture from the outdoors. But it's a, it's a one-off table and, of course, um, is somewhat of a precursor to a table that uh, I call Brand X um, sells today.
one of our competitors. Um, here you can see the um, here you can see the uh, house as it was restored by uh, the owner um, uh, who purchased the house under a complicated degree a complicated set of covenants with World Monuments and the community college to actually preserve the building and you know. You're probably all saying, what does that obelisk have to do with um, the context of the house? And the answer is, I, I really have no idea. But uh, the, he, he felt that it was an appropriate sculptural um, entryway, but it, it has nothing to do with the uh, idiom of the house. I, I'm just going to read you a brief quote um, by Stone, which I think sort of speaks to some of his thoughts uh, on the, the house. Um, changes in architecture, he's talking um, as a student, um, and he says, changes in architecture were gather gathering momentum. Le Corbusier's first books were being published, and the nearby Dessau, the Bauhaus, was founded, all heralding the arrival of the new machine age. Those ideas were contagious, and we students spent our time redesigning the United States on marble top cafe tables. And uh, I, I think it's great that he actually realized this design um, in Long Island. Um, you can see how the house has been meticulously restored. Um, it really had fallen in, into disrepair. Um, all of the um, fenestration, all of the steel, um, all, all of the cement in, in the court, and uh, the relationships between the garden and the house ha have been maintained very well. Although if you were to visit the site today, um, it's basically surrounded by what um, some people would call um, McMansions, unfortunately. Um, and here you can see a view after the trees were pruned uh, of the terraces. Um, once again, the courtyard where um, the, the, the owner at the time installed um, a, a contemporary sculpture. But he really made a good faith effort and unfortunately um, was forced to sell the house again to, um, uh, to another buyer. So it's now the, se the second buyer now is, is working on the house to restore it. And I, I think there's hope that it'll be open to the public uh, eventually. The next project I want to uh, talk to you about is um, a trade school in Germany. Um, it was designed by Hannes Meyer. It's the recipient of the first uh, World Monuments Prize for the Preservation uh, of Architecture. You, um, and I'm going to go through these slides pretty quickly. These are all prize winners from the past few years. You can see here the original plan of the school. Um, you can see here how the school uh, was restored in this uh, very exuberant uh, way with, with the, um, the garden court. Um, this was really a monumental undertaking in terms of the restoration, mainly publicly funded. Um, and the restoration of this great breezeway that connected all the buildings um, took years and years. And you can see, once again, how Hannes Meyer was most interested in creating a sense uh, of and connection to the landscape, but preserving what really um, was the key function of the school, which was, was an academic community. And the restoration here involved color analysis of all of the original Bauhaus colors, which were coded by buildings, particularly for the dormitory blocks. And really, the research was very interesting um, in terms of determining the different color palette. And you can see how uh, it was realized here in, in, in the dormitory block uh, as well. Here are the restoration architects um, celebrating their work. Um, the, the spaces in, in no way looked as they did when the building was originally uh, constructed. Uh, you can see here how, the, how it was originally, and then the historic restoration, which almost uh, gussies it up um, to a point uh, that it never had or originally. Um, here, this is the really one of my favorite slides. This is the um, stairwell and breezeway as it existed um, you know, in about 10 years ago. And the magic of, uh, of the um, design was restored, particularly these pivot windows, which were just uh, an engineering feat in terms of uh, bespoke construction. And you know, this is the type of work that World Monuments really loves to take on in concert with those around the world. And I'm assuming it's the work that really turns on most of the people in, the, in, this, in this room as well, because it's a meticulous engineering and, and design work. 
And you can see how these, these windows were originally just in the same way that Rudolph used um, his screening devices in Florida, um, how Hannes Meyer used a, a similar construction uh, here in, in, in Germany. Um, I see that my time is, is going quickly, so I'm good. So um, I, I want to give you a sense, too, of some of our other prize winners. Um, and I should say that the, uh, the prize is given every other year. Um, the jury is independent. There are no null associates associated with the jury. The jury is chaired by um, Barry Bergdahl, who's a professor of art and architecture at uh, Columbia University, and he puts together a panel of uh, individuals on a rotating basis to um, solicit projects and, and to uh, debate the merits of the projects. This one is in another amazing government-funded fund, government project uh, in the Netherlands. Um, you can see, just as in the German project, there was a sort of a broad campus plan. It was originally designed not as a school, but as a sanatorium for people um, suffering from tuberculosis. Um, and this was the building when um, the team took it over and reconceived that the building could be repurposed from, uh, from a healthcare facility for a disease that has been virtually eradicated um, to a community health center. And, um, the state of, of disrepair of this building um, would be daunting for anyone, I'm sure. And um, over a period of a decade plus, you can see how the building has been restored, how the fenestration, how the steel, how the cement has all been um, put in a contemporary context. And you know, contrast this tower with its beautiful glass stairwell uh, to what you saw originally. And um, it's, it's just, might as well have started from scratch. But it, it's the tenacity of, of the architectural team and the research that they undertook um, that really um, led the, uh, the jury to award the um, Modernism Prize during this year uh, to this project. The third prize winner um, I, that I wanted to just r run you through is a bit of a sleeper, um, and probably my favorite project um, that World Monuments has identified for uh, recognition. It's a school that was designed in the mid-50s uh, by a Japanese uh, national, and it sits on a lovely site okay, in a rural area of Japan, and immediately, hopefully, based on many of the images that you've seen um, in this slide deck, you can see the similarities and the parallels between some of the, the, the Bauhaus buildings and the American modern buildings um, uh, that I, I've shared uh, in terms of, of the way it, it just sort of um, hugs the, the riverbank and the way that the exterior stairwells are used to connect people from the outside uh, to the inside. It's not a school that would ever be built today, okay? The community was extremely, extremely proud that this building existed in a very much a Western slash Japanese idiom in the community and did not want to see the building destroyed and actually put together a plan to bring it up to code to meet the educational uh, standards uh, of, of the uh, Japanese national system. And you can see the building here restored um, by the riverbank. And what I love most about this building is the interiors and the way uh, sort of the, the um, craft uh, activity of local artisans is sort of filtered in with some of the more structural and technical um, initiatives of uh, the modernist uh, engineers and, and architects. I mean, and what better place to go to school, right? I mean, compared to some of the buildings that we see in the United States being built today for elementary education, um, this, this, is a, this is a real gem and deserved, uh, deserved the jury's recognition. Um, the last project that I want to share with you is the most recent prize that was um, awarded this past fall. And uh, it's the uh, very well-known building. I, you know, when, I, when I show the color slides, you all recognize it. It's the um, library that Alta designed in what was then uh, Finland, but is now um, Russia. And the project represents a real cultural collaboration 
between these two countries in a contemporary way in a world where collaboration on a geopolitical uh, front has not been as smooth. And I feel that the jury picked this building really to emphasize that um, architecture and design can live above some of uh, the other issues that we, we face in the contemporary world and can serve as a symbol, as I, as I said earlier, of uh, being the most collaborative of all of the arts. And here you can see the library restored. Um, you'll recognize uh, these wonderful skylights um, you know, from your Art 101 books, hopefully, and uh, the way in which the um, library was revealed uh, on the second level to visitors uh, from the entry court at, at the foot uh, of these stairs. And this was a real um, meticulous, once again, multi-year um, project principally funded by the Russians uh, in a time uh, politically when probably um, they really were focusing on, on, on many other um, areas of, of concern. Uh, and then, uh, of course, you can see how wonderful the stools actually work in the building. And the undulating ceiling um, is, is a tour de force, uh, of course, uh, of um, modernist uh, vocabulary and uh, one in which uh, you know, the building is probably best known. So hopefully I, I've given you a sense not only what we've done in advocacy, also what we've done in, in terms of recognition. And uh, I would uh, welcome any uh, discussion or questions that uh, anyone uh, may have about uh, some of the work that uh, we're doing today. And I, well, Frank would also be happy to participate in the questions. Any comments, questions? 